morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, also thank the MacArthur Foundation and Lori and the American Bar Foundation, Bar, Bar Association, Owen, Congressman Fatta. Thank you very much for your support. It's been invaluable, and I'll say a bit more about how it's invaluable as I go along. I'm not going to use slides today. I'll tell you why. I was going to the first of this week, but then I was talking to a bunch of lawyers who've heard me present before, and they say, you know, we find it distracting when there's just text on the screen and not data or anything of the sort. So I'm not going to use the slides. I'm just going to talk. And I hope you can keep your attention without the screen doing its whatever. I'm going to start with some uh, preliminaries. Then I'm going to talk about a general framework for how you ought to be thinking about the relationship of neuroscience to legal judgments generally, not only to responsibility of juveniles, but more generally. Then I'm going to talk specifically about some issues having to do with juveniles, and then I want to talk about what I think is the positive future of law and neuroscience in conclusion. That's a lot to do in 15 minutes, and I'm going to be breathtakingly superficial. All right, the first thing I want to say is, in my view, juvenile justice is broken. Too many juveniles are treated as adults, and the rest of what I have to say about juveniles I also think goes for adults. Too many are incarcerated too frequently. Too many do not receive adequate services that would help them avoid recidivism. And many, too many, are punished too harshly. So those things are true of adults and of juveniles. I also think that juveniles should be treated differently as a group, but so should some adults. And I'm going to try to say why. Now, I'm going to make the bold claim that the law has a psychology, and that psychology is folk psychology. That is, a psychological theory that explains human behavior in terms of mental states. So if I were to ask all of you to write down why you are in the room today, by the way, the same goes if I talk to a group of neuroscientists, they give me the exact same sort of response. No one tells me stories about their brains or nervous systems. People tell me a story about their desires to learn more about law and neuro. They tell me a story about their beliefs. I think I will do so if I come here today, or I desire to see my friends, and I believe they'll be here today. And then you form the intention to be here. And that's how you explain your behavior to yourself. That's how you explain the behavior of others. Folk psychology. The law is folk psychological. It's addressed to acting human beings who can potentially be guided by reason. We are reason-responsive creatures. If you think about what law is, and now talk about breathtakingly superficial, a group of rules and standards that's meant to guide behavior. What kind of creature can be guided by rules and standards? Creatures that can be guided by reason, that can use those rules and standards in thinking about what they have reason to do or not to do. Now, if you think about that for a second, it tells you immediately that the law's criteria for responsibility have to be behavioral. By behavioral, I mean acts and mental states. I mean it really broadly. Here's why. Think about the classes of people we think are not responsible or are less responsible. Young children, some people with severe mental disorder, people with dementias, people who've just had trauma, what do they all have in common? They all have in common, either as a result of developmental immaturity or some kind of abnormality, they have in common an inability to be guided by reason sufficiently for us to hold them to be either responsible or competent. The law's criteria, if you think about it, the criteria for competence and responsibility are all acts and mental states, 100%. You don't want to forget that. Why? Because when you're thinking about the relationship of any other kind of evidence, it's going to have to translate, it's going to have to be addressed to the acts and mental states that are the law's concern. So the question always is translation. And here I want to draw a distinction between psychiatry, psychology on the one hand, and neuroscience on the other hand. Psychiatry and psychology sometimes treat us as objects, as pieces of meat. But more often, it's treating us as an acting human being with aspirations, with goals, with a sense of past, present, and future. So there's a natural relation between the way psychology and psychiatry talk and the way law talks. Neuroscience is a purely mechanistic science. Neurons don't have a sense of past, present, and future. Neurons don't have aspirations. Neurons, not, nor neural networks, nor the connectome, do not have mental states. These are properties of whole people. 
to the best of our knowledge, which is not to say that you don't need to have a brain active to do those things. You do. But don't misunderstand me. Now, so having said all that, here's the question for neuroscience and law. How precisely, when someone wants to adduce a bit of neuroscientific evidence, either at the policy-making level or at the individual case adjudication level, how precisely does that neuroscience evidence answer the question that the law is asking? And the law is always asking a behavioral question, broadly understood to mean acts and mental states. So that's what you always have to do. Now, the problem, often enough, as I'll say again later, is many of the studies that have been done in neuroscience are not addressed to legal questions. That is one of the glories of the MacArthur Foundation. As you've heard earlier, MacArthur is dedicated to helping to fund research that other people want, don't want to fund. So as BJ and Jeff will tell you, you apply to NIMH for a grant, there's no box for legally relevant research. MacArthur does that, and we love you for it. Okay, next thing to notice, I have identified in the literature something I call brain overclaim syndrome. It's much, much endemic among certain quarters of the legal academy and among neuroscientists as well. I've preliminarily identified, prior to full behavioral validation, I've identified a number of signs and symptoms. I only want to talk about four that are important for us here. The first is confusion about the brain-mind action relation. Jeff has already alluded to this. We do not know how the brain enables the mind. We do not know how action is possible. If your brain is dead, you're dead and not doing much of interest at all. So we know the brain is crucial, but we do not understand at the basic level how the brain enables the mind and action. And that is going to be an impediment to our understanding of, of complex human behavior until we get better at it, which we will. Second, there's overconfidence in the current status of neuroscience. People arguing, and the people in, you know, that you've heard speak so far do not do this, but many people do. They make vastly overinflated claims about what we know today. There are substantial present scientific and conceptual difficulties, which I think future science will remedy. But the fact that we're in the beginning stages, as was alluded to, is no surprise. FMRI, which is the technique of choice, as Jeff has told you, has only come online with lots of scanners for lots of subjects in the last, let's call it, 10 to 15 years. Small numbers of subjects, expensive to do, and we're dealing with the hardest problem in science, how the brain enables the mind, or what many people think is the hardest problem in science. It's no surprise we're just at the beginning. For example, we can't diagnose mental disorder using any biomarker at present. We can't even severe mental disorders. You've seen the illusions in BJ and David's talk to the overlapping curves. Yes, you will see small mean differences, but they're too small to use the neuroscience, all right? The third thing I want to talk about as part of the confusion is misunderstanding the criteria for responsibility. Too often we think the criteria are not the criteria they are. Now, we're lawyers in this room, so it's a, it's a friendly audience. You do understand that the criteria are mental states and actions. But what that means is, if you have a disjunct between a bit of neuroscience evidence and the behavioral evidence, cases of suspected malingering aside, you always have to believe the behavior. Actions speak louder than images. If someone is clearly not malingering and is psychotic, I don't care if their brain looks normal, they're psychotic. If someone is clearly acting rational and has always acted rationally, I don't care how bad their brain looks. They're not psychotic. And we have already decided that psychosis should play a role in our judgments in many cases about who and who is not responsible. The last thing before I move to the more general concerns for juveniles is this. We often confuse a bit of truth about the world with what its legal and moral implications are. So although I applaud the results in the Roper, Graham, Miller trilogy, I would like to suggest to you that the science can't tell us whether juveniles are less responsible or not. Even if there is a mean difference, 
on all the relevant criteria between juveniles and adults. The question is, is that difference large enough that it should make a legal difference? That's the law's question, and that's a question science can't tell us. It can tell us what are the differences. BJ laid them out beautifully for you. Are those differences sufficient to make a legal difference? That's a normative question. That's a legal question. That's not a scientific question. Okay. Chief Justice Roberts, and let me talk about juveniles now, said in Miller-Jackson, juveniles are different. Quote, these cases, Roper and Graham, stand for the proposition that teenagers are less mature, less responsible, and less fixed in their ways than adults. Not that a Supreme Court case was needed to establish that. Precisely. In recognition of such differences, the common law treated juveniles differently for centuries, and we've had a juvenile court for over 100 years. We know kids are different. Now, some people think <coughs> that this claim is under-theorized, this difference is under-theorized. I don't. I look at it and I say, what do kids lack? They lack the full capacity for rationality. That's the core for why they are, in general, less responsible, less competent. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't going to be overlaps between the curves. Again, there are. Leaves open, as David said. Do we want to go categorical or do we want to go individual? But what we do know is, in general, they are different because they lack rational capacity. Again, nothing wrong with them. It's just developmental immaturity. So this difference immediately leads to two questions. What does the new neuroscience add to the behavioral science and to common sense observation? And what are the normative implications? Now, here's what I would like to say. What largely, at present, and I keep wanting to stretch at present, because as the science gets better, these sorts of observations could change. At present, what the neuroscience basically does is simply give us a bunch of convergent information. We already knew the kids were different. The behavioral science very precisely shows us in what ways they're different. Indeed, the neuroscience is never better than the behavioral science because we identify behaviorally a task such as a go, no-go task. We see who's good at it and who's not. Then we put people in the scanner. But if the you know, behavioral test of go, no-go is no good, the scanning data is not going to be very good. This, by the way, is why I think we're not good with biomarkers for, the, for diagnosing mental disorder. It's because our behavioral criteria for mental disorder are not very good. And that's why I don't think the neuroscience is helping us all that much. It's not a problem with the neuroscience. It's a problem with the basic descriptive psychiatry. But I'm special pleading for the moment. OK, so what have we got? We've got clearly identified and often precisely mapped behavioral differences. And now we find in the scanner that just what we might expect to find, we find. Well, that's really good convergent evidence. But you know what? If I didn't find a, behavior, a, a, a neural difference between the brains of adolescents and adults, I'd still think they were different. And we always thought they were different. It's the convergent evidence that helps us. Now, it may have rhetorical value. You know, you see a scan and it shows, gee, here's what activates or doesn't activate enough in adolescents and does or does not in adults. Oh, that's really persuasive. But when the Supreme Court said in Miller, the science and the social science, I was infuriated. Because social <laughs> science is science. There's good and bad science of any sort. And there's legal relevance or irrelevance in any particular case. All right, I've got one minute left. I want to talk about the positives, because I've been giving you what is, I hope, not a deflationary, but simply a cautious set of ways of thinking. OK, first, in tandem with behavioral science, I think neuroscience can help us reach what I call a conceptual empirical equilibrium, that is, the neuroscience helps hone the behavioral science, and the behavioral science helps hone the neural science. And together, I think, we can look at some of the concepts and categories of responsibility. What are the criteria for competence, for instance? What are the criteria for responsibility to see if the law is getting it right, or if we can't tinker more effectively? 
You've heard or an allusion already to Ken Keel's study, well, actually it was Eyal Aharoni, but it was out of Ken Keel's lab, showing that you can use a neural marker to help predict recidivism. Not ready for prime time yet, but it's a real proof of concept because, look, in the criminal justice system, we make predictions all the time. We've already decided it is okay to make decisions that are important in people's lives based on predictions. We're lawyers. What's the good argument if we have already decided we, can, we should do something for doing it worse as opposed to better? I don't know what that argument would look like. And if neuroscience can help us do it better, all the, all the power to us. Lastly, as we understand the mechanisms of the brain better and understand the brain behavior link better, what we all hope is we will be able to come up with more effective and safe interventions to help people fly straight. And that would be a great social good. Thank you.